So in section 11.2, we kind of had an introduction to probability and what it works in some really simple cases, uh, like rolling one die or two dice or so, some relatively basic things like that. Now in 11.3, we step up the difficulty level a little bit and we start talking about the probability of multiple events, uh, meaning, for example, that, that multiple things are going to happen and we want to know how likely it is that a certain thing would occur in each of those cases there. So a little bit of vocab just to get started right here. We're going to define the term compound event. <clears throat> it's kind of an interesting definition right there, guys. Meaning an event, just one of, though, uh, one of them, in which there would be multiple ways in order to be successful. So if we were in class, what I would probably do right now is ask you guys to raise your hand if, uh, and I would just kind of think here, if you were a sophomore or if you were a male student. I'd ask you guys to raise your hand. And we would look around the room and probably find that a pretty good number of people were raising their hands. Now, what you'd find right there is that people raising their hands could be sophomores, either male or female, or we could also have male students who are not sophomores raising their hand. A compound event then means that there's more than one way that you can quote unquote succeed in that particular event. That's not an example really of succeeding like winning or losing, but anyway, that's just a case of what a compound event might look like. And you'll start to see some probability questions here later on in the day where there might be multiple ways of being successful. Like in this case, we might be looking at either a face card or a seven, two different things. Now, a little bit more vocab right here. The second term we're going to talk about and the third term, these two go hand in hand. Mutually exclusive events and mutually inclusive events. So mutually exclusive events, exclusive meaning things that are kind of unique and by themselves right there, are two things that cannot occur at the same time. Like if I went back to that example I just kind of uh, did a sneak peek of a second ago right here, it's impossible for a card to be a face card and a seven at the same time right there. So that would be an example of what we mean by mutually exclusive events. You can be one, but not the other. So for mutually exclusive events, I might ask you guys in the class right now to raise your hand if you're a sophomore or a junior. All right. And what would happen right there then is all the sophomores would raise their hands, all the juniors would raise their hands, and basically everybody except freshmen or seniors would have their hands raised. But for mutually exclusive, it's one or the other, but it can't be both. Nobody can raise their hand if I said, raise your hand if you're a sophomore and a junior. Because that would mean that you would have to satisfy both of those criteria in order to be successful, in order to raise your hand. And nobody out there is both a sophomore and a junior. It's one or the other. So when the probability of these two things happening simultaneously at the same time, when that probability is zero, that's when we're dealing with mutually exclusive events. And those are actually easier for us to determine the probability of. The harder one is this third term right here, mutually inclusive events. Those are events that can occur at the same time. So that would be when the probability of A and B is greater than zero, meaning that that probability actually exists and this is possible. So back to the case I said earlier, guys, if I asked you to raise your hand if you were a sophomore and if you were male, it's possible for people in your classroom to be both a sophomore and a male student at the same time. So therefore, that would be an example then of mutually inclusive events, and those probabilities are a little bit harder to find. All right, guys, a couple of formulas right here that are going to help us out. This one right here, guys, is one that I put in right here, and I'm actually not sure how much you're going to see this uh, on the homework right here. It didn't really seem like a great spot to bring it up, but I wanted to find it at some point right there and get that in, that if we're talking about the probability of one thing happening and then another thing happening, this is really a probability that we would talk about with two events happening. What we do then, guys is we multiply our two probabilities right here. We do the probability of event A, and then we multiply that. Eh, it really should have been like a dot like that, but that's what I had. Anyway, times the probability of event B. And I'll give you an example in just a second of what that one would look like. But this second formula right here, guys, the probability of compound events, this is the one you're going to spend the majority of your time using in our homework here on section 11.3. So the probability of either A or B occurring, so for example, raise your hand if you're a male or a sophomore, 
Well, what we do there is we take the probability of event A and we add that to the probability of event B. Or actually means that we're increasing our probability, so that's why we do the addition with or there. However, at the end now, you have to subtract from that the probability of both A and B occurring at the same time. So this would be the formula here, guys, for when we're talking about one event, but we've got mutually inclusive <coughs> things going on right here, uh, things that could both happen at the same time. So I think a real good thing, guys, to throw in your notes, maybe just somewhere up at the top, is when we're talking about probability and you read the word and, and makes something less likely to occur because the first thing has to happen and the second thing has to happen. That is when we normally multiply our probabilities together. But if you see the word or, in a probability statement, or is a good thing for us, guys. It makes things more likely to happen because we only need to satisfy one of the two conditions. And so normally then, when we see the word or, we are going to add our probabilities together. And you can kind of see that up above, guys. There's the word and, and then right there, there's multiplication. Here is the word or in the second formula, and there is addition right there, although you do have to turn around and do some subtraction as well. Now, you'll notice I didn't put a formula here for mutually exclusive events, and that's because, we wrote this down just a second ago, in mutually exclusive events right here, the probability of A and B occurring is equal to zero. So actually, this same formula right here works for mutually exclusive events, but this probability right here ends up being zero, which means you can just ignore it if the events are mutually exclusive exclusive. We'll get to that later too. All right, let's take a look at this first example. And I'm recording this on what, guys? April 5th. Uh, we just watched, or I just watched anyway, the uh, NCAA Women's Basketball Championship on Sunday night and then the Men's Championship uh, on Monday night right after that. Maybe you guys watched some of the same thing. So I started thinking about free throws here. So a basketball player is going to uh, be an 85% free throw shooter, meaning that on the season right here, she made 85% of all of the free throws that she shot. So let's talk about this now. A lot of times at the end of a game, a player will get fouled just as a way of, of stopping the clock, and then they'll get sent to the free throw line and get two free throws. So if this girl is an 85% 85, 85 free throw shooter, what's the probability that she's going to make both of her free throws? So we really want to know what's the probability, if I could write this another way, that she's going to make the first free throw and, that's the key right there, that she's going to make the second free throw as well. So there's that word and now. We're talking about two events. That means that we're going to multiply these two probabilities together. Now, that number that was given to you right here, 85%, is the probability that she'll make any one free throw. So, her probability of making the first free throw is going to be 85%. And I'd probably write that as a 0 0.85. That's the probability of making free throw number one. And then on the second free throw, she also has a 0.85 chance of making that one as well. So all we would need to do here, guys, is multiply the 0.85 times the 0.85. And that should give us now the probability of her making both free throws. So I'm just going to type in a 0 0.85, and I'm going to square that here and get this number here. Now, I'm going to go back to percentages right now. So that 0.7225 is 72.25%, 72.25%. And I'm hoping that makes sense to you guys. It's less likely that she would make both free throws than it is that she would make just one free throw. Okay, second question now. What's the probability that she misses both of them? All right, this is getting into something I'm going to talk about a little bit later here called complementary probability, but I'm hoping you guys can understand this without having discussed it uh, yet. If there's an 85% chance that she is going to make her free throw, well, there's only two possible outcomes when a basketball player shoots a free throw. Either it's a make or a miss, and those two percentages have to add up to 100. So if she's got an 85% chance of making her free throws, that means she's got a 15% chance of missing 
her free throws. So on the first free throw, and now if we want to miss both of them, she's got a 15% chance of missing the first and a 15% chance of missing the second free throw. So let's go to the calculator now and type in 0.15 and we'll square that as well and get this number right over here, 0.0225, slide that decimal two to the right, 2.25%. So not a very likely outcome right here that an 85% free throw shooter would miss both of her free throws. That's where we're at right now. And now there's really only one other possibility that's out there. She makes one free throw and she misses the other one. So here's what that one would look like here, guys. For let's say she wants to make the first free throw right there, 0.85 would be the probability that she makes the first one. And her probability then of missing the second one is 0.15. Now, when I go ahead and multiply those two things together, 0.85 times 0.15, all right, that gets us 12.75%. So I'm going to write that one down here, 12.75, and we've got that. Now, Something interesting happens right here, and this is the first time I've had the opportunity to talk about this with you guys, at least in terms of the three videos that we're on so far. If you can exhaust all of the possible outcomes in an experiment or a series of events, the overall probability of everything that could happen always needs to add up to the magic number now of 100%. And if you take a look at what we have here, guys, let's just see what happens when we add all those together. We had a 72.25% chance that she makes both free throws, a 2.25% chance that she misses both, and then a 12.75% chance that she makes one and misses one. That should have added up to 100, but uh-oh, it only added up to 87.25. There's some missing probability out there, which means that we made a mistake somewhere, and I'm going to tell you where that is right now. We did the first one correctly. 85%, 85% gets us this number. We did the second one correctly. 15%, 15% gets us that. Where we goofed up ever so slightly was this third probability. What we actually found right here, the 12.75% is the very specific probability that she would make the first one and miss the second. But there's also the possibility, guys, that she would miss the first free throw and make the second. So that one, uh, you don't really need to write this down. I'll show you why in just a second. That probability would have been a 15% chance that she misses the first and an 85% chance that she makes the second. Now, because of the commutative property of multiplication, that's going to get you the exact same thing here again. And now we would add these two together here to get, oh boy, 24. That would be a 25.5% chance then that she makes one and misses the other. And that 12.75% is what we were missing. Now, I said you didn't need to write that down because here's really the way they would do this in probability. We would just multiply this probability here by two because there's two different ways that scenario number three could occur. She could go make and then miss, which is what we did first, but she could also go miss and then make. So because there's two ways that can happen, that 12.75% really should have been, uh-oh, what did I say? A 25.5%. 0.5%. And now, you guys, when I add all three of those up, I think we're in business. 72.25 plus 2.25 plus a 25.5% chance. Yep, that adds up to the magic number of 100%. So all three of these answers now are correct. And this is a great way. I've used this exact same thing myself, guys. This is a great way when you're trying to determine if you've done probability correctly. If you can list out every single possible outcome, all of those probabilities, probabilities have to add up to 100. Okay, so that's just kind of how you can use probability within sports a little bit. All right, this problem, though, is a little bit more typical from what you're going to see in your homework right here. So what's going on now, guys? You're going to draw one card at random from a standard 52-card deck, and we're going to find each probability. Okay, and what you guys will notice right here is the word or is showing up over and over and over again right here. So 
That means if I go back to what we wrote a little while ago, or probabilities mean that we add up the probability of both of those two things happening independently, but then we have to come back and subtract the probability of them happening simultaneously, both of them happening. So let's take a look at what's going on here. We want to know if you're going to pull one card out of a deck, what's the probability that it's either a face card or a seven? Now, the first thing I want to talk about here, guys, and we already discussed this earlier, are these two events here mutually exclusive or mutually inclusive? Well, depending on how well you know how a deck of card works, a face card, everybody, is defined as either a jack, a queen, or a king. Aces are not considered face cards because they don't have anybody's face drawn on them. Sevens are something totally different, everybody. Sevens are not face cards. Those would be number cards. So for that reason, because a card can be either a face card or a seven, but it cannot be both, these would be mutually exclusive events. And that is good for us, guys, because that makes the probability a little bit quicker. What we're going to do then is the probability of drawing a face card and then adding to that the probability of drawing a seven. So face cards, jack, queen, and king. And remember, guys, there's four different suits in a deck of cards. So we've got three face cards that are spades, three that are hearts, three that are clubs, and three that are diamonds. That's a grand total of 12 out of 52 cards in the deck. So your probability of selecting a face card is 12 over 52. We're going to add to that now the probability of selecting a seven. And how many sevens are there in the deck? Again, one in each suit. So that's going to be a four, and that is out of 52 as well. Now, technically, we should subtract from that the probability of A and B occurring at the same time. But since these are mutually exclusive events, that probability of drawing a card that is both a face card and a seven at the same time is zero. So you can kind of ignore that minus zero there if the events are mutually exclusive. So let's add those two together, guys. 16 over 52. And if you did this in your calculator, it would do the work for you. We can divide out a four from both numerator and denominator there and get four thirteenths for that probability. Now, as I've said before, you could absolutely express that as a decimal or as a percent, but as I think you're going to find, guys, nothing divides by 13 evenly. That's a really ugly number. So 4 thirteenths would be that. This would be a case where I would think you're much better off just leaving your answer as a fraction. So 4 thirteenths, I think, is the best way to express that answer. Okay, let's move on to example two now. Again, you're still drawing just one card here. What's the probability that that one card is either an even numbered card or a diamond? All right. So first thing to think about, are these two events right here mutually exclusive or mutually inclusive? The question would be, are there any cards in the deck that are both evens and diamonds simultaneously? And the answer to that is yes. There's a whole bunch of cards that are even numbered and diamonds. So we'll talk about what those look like in just a second. So this probability, I'm going to start this one down here. Let's talk about the probability of drawing an even number. All right, guys, what are the even numbered cards you can get in the deck? There are twos, fours, sixes, eights, and tens. That's it. Uh, an ace counts as one, so that would be odd. Face cards don't have numbers. They're not even. So you've got one, two, three, four, five even numbered cards in each suit. And again, there are four suits. So the four times five is going to get us a probability of 20 out of 52 for drawing an even card. Then I see the word or. We're going to add to that now the probability of selecting a diamond. So with 52 cards in the deck and cut up into four suits, this is just a number you guys should know here, 52 divided by four is 13. That, that 13 shows up over and over and over again when you're talking about a deck of cards. So there are 13 diamonds in the deck out of a grand total of 52. And maybe that doesn't surprise you. I hope that fraction right there simplifies to one-fourth. There's four suits, one-fourth of the cards in the deck are diamonds. So 13 out of 52. But now, because here we are dealing with, I should have written this down, sorry, we are dealing with mutually inclusive 
events right here, meaning things that can happen at the same time. We now need to subtract from that, everybody, the probability of picking a card that is both even and a diamond at the same time. Well, again, we mentioned these one, two, three, four, five even numbered cards. And on that, out of those five right there, there, there's one each in diamonds. There's a two of diamonds, a four of diamonds, a six of diamonds, eight of diamonds, and 10 of diamonds. There are five cards in the entire deck, you guys, that are even and diamonds. And we already counted those five even numbered diamonds here and we counted them here as well. So that's why we need to subtract now the five out of 20, uh, excuse me, the five out of, that'd be 52 right there, because we accidentally double counted those both in the first fraction and in the second fraction. So that's what we needed to do here, guys. 20 plus 13 is going to be 33. 33 minus 5 would be 28. That's all out of 52. Again, your calculator will do all this for you. Don't panic. And divide out the 4 here, and you'd get a 7 out of 13. And that probability, guys, is the first one we've seen here in a while that's actually greater than 50%. So that means if you were to just go to a deck of cards and pull out one random card, there's a better chance than not that you're going to get something that is either even or a diamond. Okay, now number three is kind of a weird one that I threw at you right here. What's the probability of getting either a red card or a black card or an ace? Well, this is kind of the joke right here. So first question right here would ask yourselves, guys, are we talking about mutually exclusive or mutually inclusive events? And that's actually a tricky question because cards can be red, cards can be black. They cannot be both of those two things, though. All right, hopefully you guys know this right here. Spades and clubs are the two black suits. Hearts and diamonds are the two red suits right there. So these two things right here would be mutually exclusive. Okay, can't do both. But as soon as we throw aces into the mix, now all of a sudden this becomes a mutually inclusive event because a card can be red and an ace. It also can be black and an ace at the same time. So this is going to be kind of an interesting one. Probability of selecting a red card. All right, guys, there's four suits in the deck right there, 13 cards in each suit, and two of those suits, diamonds and hearts, are red. So that means our probability of selecting a red is 26 out of 52. We would add to that the probability of selecting a black card, which would be 26 out of 52 as well. And then adding to that the probability of selecting an ace. There's four aces out of 52 cards in the deck. Now we're about to run into a big fat problem if we were to stop right now. Don't write this part down, everybody, because if you were to add up 26 plus 26 plus 4, you're going to get 56 out of 52 for your probability. And the one thing that should be jumping off the screen at you right now, guys, what I just wrote down is an impossibility. You can never have a probability greater than 1 or 100%. And 56 over 52 is definitely bigger than 1. That means that we goofed something up. And what was it? We forgot that last component right here of subtracting then the probability of multiple events occurring at the same time. So what's the probability of drawing a card that is red and an ace at the same time, that would be 2 out of 52, because there's two red aces. Then I'm going to subtract from that the probability of selecting a black ace, 2 out of 52 there as well. And I probably should have also subtracted the probability of selecting a red card and a black card, but that probability is zero because those events are mutually exclusive. So putting all this together here, guys, uh, I kind of did this work already. 26 plus 26 is 52, plus 4 is 56, minus 2 is 54, minus 2 is 52 out of 52, which of course is 1. Now, is that probability mathematically possible? Yes. What we wrote down in 11.2 is this simple fact, guys. Zero must always be less than or equal to your probability, which must always be less than or equal to one. It is possible for a probability to equal one or 100%, but that means something important we better talk about 
That means that the event you're discussing is guaranteed to happen. So is that what we're saying right here, guys, that the event we're talking about here in example three is guaranteed to happen? Answer to that is yes. And I actually didn't even need this part right here. Probability of selecting either a red card or a black card. Guys, every card in the deck is either red or black. So you could add as many ores as you want here at the end. It doesn't really matter. Right here, your probability has to be 100% because there's no card in the deck that is not either red or black. So that one is the correct answer right there for example number three. All right, so just kind of a little head scratcher right there, but I wanted you guys to see that the math does work out there if you do it carefully. Okay, shifting gears just a little bit right here. This is a vocab term I hinted at just a second ago, but we'll go ahead and define it formally now. Complementary events are defined as two events that combine to represent the entire possible outcome of an experiment. Now, I just made that definition up myself. I didn't look that up, and I probably should have, but I think it kind of works. But more to the point, you guys all do better with simple uh, numerical statements rather than Mr. Fontana's long, wordy ones. So here we go. The probability of an event occurring plus the probability of what we call a prime and a prime right there would represent then the complement of event a happening so if you were to add up the probability of something occurring plus the probability of its complement occurring, we always should get one then for that probability. And so what I talked about just a second ago was actually a good example of that. Every card in the deck is either red or black. So those would be what we would call complementary events because Together, they make up every single possible thing that could happen. So when you're dealing with complementary events, the sum of your probabilities always has to be 1, and of course that's equal to 100% if you wanted to look at it that way. So how can complementary probabilities be used to help us? Well, let's do two simple examples and then one more interesting one. We're going to flip a coin, everybody, and a coin flip is a great example for elementary probability because there's only two possible outcomes. Every time you flip a coin, you are either going to get heads or tails. So this is what we would call complementary outcomes right here. Because everything that can happen when you flip a coin is represented either by heads or tails. Now, let's do this the quote-unquote hard way. What's the probability of getting heads? One out of two. What's the probability of getting tails? One out of two. And of course, one half plus one half is two halves, which is just one. So that kind of supports the idea right here that when you flip a coin, heads and tails are complementary events because you add the probabilities together and get one. How about rolling one six-sided die, everybody? What's your probability of rolling a six? That would be one out of six possible things that could happen. What's your probability, then, of rolling a non-six? Well, what are the outcomes on a die, then, that would not be a six? A one, two, three, four, or five. There are five results that are not six. So that probability is five over six, and you'd add those two together to get six over six, which, of course, would equal one as well. Every time you roll a die, you are either going to get a six or a non-six. So those, again, would be complementary events. It always has to be one or the other. And then you can use complementary events here, guys, to answer an actually pretty complicated question like this one right here. You're going to take a 10-question multiple-choice test, and it's four options per question, so A, B, C, and D. What's the probability that at least one of the correct answers is C? All right, so this is actually pretty hard, guys. The probability of, now at least, would mean greater than or equal to 1 C. That's what we're trying to find right here. And if you were going to do this problem in a straightforward manner, it's really, really difficult because what you would need to do is the probability of exactly one C, don't write this down, then the probability of two C's, then the probability of three C's, and so on and so on and so on, all the way until you get to the probability of all 10 being C's. So that's 10 different probabilities you would have to find 
And then you would need to add all 10 of those together. This would be a pretty difficult problem and very, very time consuming. Unless we realize that there's something else here at work. We can talk about pro uh, complementary events right here because here's what's going on. We want to know the probability that at least one of those answers is a C. The complement of that event. What, what would be the opposite then? The compli, I can't spell right here. The complement right here, the only thing that could happen that wouldn't satisfy this is if we had no C's at all. So I want you to think about that, guys. Every time we take this 10 question test, either you're going to get at least one C or you're going to get no C's at all. That means that these are complementary events. So actually, let me amend what I'm going to write here just a little bit. The probability of getting at least one C plus the probability of getting no C's at all has to add up to one. Those are complementary events, and one of those two things is guaranteed to happen. Now, if we want this first term by itself, I'm just going to subtract the probability of getting no C's from each side of the equation, just like we always do with equations, and those cancel, and we get that the probability of at least one C is equal to 1 minus the probability of getting no C's. So let's talk about that here, guys. This is now going to be 1 minus, and the probability of no C's. Now let's think about that. The probability of getting a C on any one question here is going to be 1 out of 4. So the probability of getting a non-C is the complement of that, which is going to be 3 out of 4. So the probability of not getting a C on one problem would be three-fourths, but there are 10 questions here, guys. We'd have to take that three-fourths to the 10th power. Three-fourths for the first question, times three-fourths for the second question, times three-fourths for the third question, and so on and so forth. So that just made this kind of a difficult problem if we were going to try to do it by hand because I don't think any of us know what 3 to the 10th or 4 to the 10th are, but I could go to my calculator here, and I bet it could do it for us without too much difficulty. 1 minus, and then in parentheses, I'll do 3 over 4. Let's get out of there, close that parentheses, and take all of that to the 10th power. And when I hit Enter, oh, my smarty pants calculator gave that to me as a fraction, as a decimal right here, guys, 0.94368, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to make that a percent. I'm going to round it to the nearest hundred then. 94.37% is what we're going to get here. 94.37%. Meaning, everybody, that it is very, very likely that we're going to have at least one answer of C on that test. Now, the complement of that, if I can do that in my head right here, would be 5.63% would be the chance of having no C's at all on that particular experiment right there. And, and that kind of makes sense. That's actually higher than I would have thought. It's pretty unlikely that in 10 questions, none of them would be equal to C, which of course then makes it very likely that at least one of them is going to be C. We'd probably expect on average about two and a half questions there to be C because that's one fourth of the 10 questions. All right, everybody, that is everything I have for you right here on section 11.3. So let's dive into that homework. Hopefully these notes help, and let us know when you guys have some questions. Good luck, everybody.